Hey, hello everyone and welcome back to our online class. For today's discussion, we will be tackling Chapter 3, Western Art History. But before we begin with our class, let's have a minute of silence for our personal prayers. Okay, now we can start with our class. Now, before we begin with the basic objectives of this chapter, I will be explaining first the featured painting for our title slide. The featured painting is entitled The Disintegration of the Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. The featured painting was created between 1952 to 1954. It has a dimension of 25.4 by 33 centimeters, and it is currently housed in the Salvador Dali Museum. We have three objectives for this chapter. Number one, for us to be able to describe the history and evolution of art through the five great art periods. Second, for us to be able to give concrete examples of art pieces for every period. And our last objective, to be able to identify the famous artists of Western Europe. Now, before we discuss the different art pieces belonging to the five great art periods, let us start first by defining the term Western art. Now, when we say Western art, it has a very broad scope. There are thousands of art pieces which you can label under the wing of Western art. Even the term West and East or West versus East is still debatable. How can we say these specific countries or locations belong to West and these particular locations belong to the East? Because it would depend on where you stand, but how you differentiate the different directions. But for the sake of this discussion, when we say Western art, it largely describes the art of Western Europe, but is also used as a general category for forms of art that are now geographically widespread, but have their roots in Europe. Now, for example, there is a specific art piece being housed in a museum in Singapore, which we can label under the East side. Even though that art piece is currently housed in Singapore, but if the painting or the art piece was made back in Western Europe, then it can still be labeled under the umbrella of Western art. It doesn't matter where the art piece is currently located. As long as it was made back in Western Europe, it can still be labeled as Western art. Western art can be divided into five great periods. The first one, we have the prehistoric period. The second one, we have the ancient Egyptian period. The third one, we have the Greek period. Fourth, you have medieval period. And the last period, which is considered as the golden age of Western European art, we have the Renaissance period. Now, to make our discussion much easy, for every period, I will be giving concrete examples of art pieces so that you would have an idea on what are the types of style, artistic styles, that was present during that period. Each of the great art period have their own impact or contribution to the evolution of art in general. And each of this period have helped or shaped on how we visualize the concept of art in the modern time. And for that, let us start with the very first great art period, and that is the prehistoric art. Now, when we say prehistoric, it pertains to a time 
in our history where there is still no writing system to document our history. So the prehistoric period can be divided into three. The first one, we have the Stone Age. Okay, The designation of these periods as Stone Age derives from the use of stone tools and weapons during that time. Now, the Stone Age period can still be further subdivided into three periods. The first one, we have Paleolithic. Now, the word Paleolithic comes from two Greek words. We have Palaios, which means old, and Lithos, which means stone. So, it can roughly translate as Old Stone Age. During the Paleolithic period, the major discovery was fire, the usage of fire. Now, the second subtype, we have the Mesolithic. The word Mesolithic comes from two Greek words again. We have Mesos, which means middle, and Lithos, which means stone. So, it can roughly translate as Middle Stone Age. Now, Mesolithic period was an era in Western Europe wherein it became a period of transition, more noteworthy for its cultural and environmental changes rather than uh, for its art because it followed the end of the Ice Age and the development of a more temperate climate in about 11,000 BC. Now, with the retreat of the glaciers, the glaciers were slowly melting and because of that, forests have expanded. Animals that had been hunted in uh, the Paleolithic era, uh, they have either died or they have migrated into other places. And people began to congregate around bodies of water. So because of these changes, another source of food subsistence was created by the people. Aside from hunting and gathering, fishing became a major source of food. Now, by the end of the Mesolithic period, many nomadic hunter-gatherer societies were becoming settled agricultural communities. Now, the last subtype, you have Neolithic period. Now, the concept of Neolithic comes from two Greek words. Again, we have neos, which means new, and lithos, which means stone. So, it can roughly translate as the new stone Age. During the New Stone Age, it was the revolutionary shift from hunting and gathering towards farming or agriculture. So it was in the Neolithic period wherein a new source of food production or food subsistence again was discovered, and that is agriculture or farming. It contributed to the development of a new art form, and that is monumental stone architecture or what we call as megaliths. Now, the second, we have the Bronze Age, which is characterized by the use of bronze. And the last period, in the prehistoric period, you have the Iron Age, which is characterized by the use of iron and steel. As what I have shared to you in the previous slide, during the Neolithic period, there was a new form of art that was created, and that is megalith or megalithic art. Now, there are three different types of megalithic art. The first type of megalithic art is what you call menhir. Now, the term menhir came from two Celtic words, men meaning stone and hir meaning law. So these are unhewn or slightly shaped single stones or monolith, usually standing upright in the ground. Now, please look at the left side of the slide. You can see an example of a menhir, which is located in Karnak, Brittany, in France. Now, what was the purpose of menhir for prehistoric people? Menhirs were used by the people as a territory divider between communities. The second type of megalithic art are what you call dolmen. Dolmen came from the Celtic word dol, meaning table, and men, meaning stone. So these are chambers or enclosures consisting of two or more vertical stones supporting a large single stone, much as legs support a table. Now please look again on the left side. That is another example of a dolmen 
from the same place in Carnap, Brittany, in France. Now, what was the purpose of dolmen for prehistoric people? Dolmen were used as burial chambers or a collection of these were used as underground tunnels. The last type of megalithic art are cromlechs. Cromlech came from the Celtic word, which means circular place in English. These are megalithic structures in which groups of men here form circles or semicircles. Now, according to archaeologists, the Stonehenge was used as a sundial to determine time for it is strategically located on top of a hill. Another theory was it was used as a communal place where prehistoric people can conduct rituals. Now, the famous example of a cromlech is Stonehenge, which is located in Wiltshire, United Kingdom. Now, let us continue with the tools used during the Stone Age period. The first type of stone tool is what we call a pebble tool. A pebble tool contains a curved edge on the other side and a sharp edge on the other. The pebble tool is the very first cutting device created by humans and considered as the oldest type of tool made by humans. Now, if you would look closely at the picture on your right, your pebble tool is actually a prototype of our modern knives because the handle is located on the other side and the blade is located on the opposite side. The second type is bifacial tool. A bifacial tool is a hand axe. It is a prehistoric stone tool flake with two faces or two sides. The bifacial tool can be used as a knife. It can also be used as a picker, a scraper for meat, or weapon. The third type, you have your flake tool. This hand tool are usually formed by crushing off a small or large fragment then used as the tool. One disadvantage of a flake tool is it easily gets blunt or madaling makurol. But a flake tool is also advantageous because it can be likened to a Swiss knife. It has multiple purposes. Every side of a flake tool has different levels of sharpness. Therefore, it can be used in many ways. New flakes were very sharp, but it quickly becomes blunt during the use and had to be sharpened again by further flaking, and this process is called the retouch process. The last type of stone tool are what you call a blade. Blade tools are stone tools created by striking a long narrow flake from a stone core. This procedure of cutting the stone and creating the blades is called lithic reduction. Now, if you would compare this kind of tool versus a bifacial tool, they may look slightly the same. But if you would look at the ends closely, the blade tool is sharp on the opposite end, while on the other side it is flat. Bifacial tool, both of its ends are sharp. Now, why is the other end of a blade tool flat? Because after chipping the blades, they are being integrated into larger tools. The very first weapon that was created by humans, and that is a spear.